All righty, how you guys doing? All right, none of you. All right, good, good job. This is going to be one of those nights, but that's right. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good to see you guys. Glad you're here. And we're going to start off with some uh, exciting announcements. Of course, that's right. What? Two weeks. That's right, Ron. Two weeks. Our next uh, special guest star. That's right. Pastor Tom Hughes. Text him this week. And I said, no pressure. I keep telling everybody that you're going to tell us what in the world's really going on. So he said, okay, I'll do that. So anyway, he's going to let us know what's really going on in the world, certainly in that, from a biblical perspective, certainly. And Lord willing, after that, the next month, Olivier Milnek will be in, and uh, he's going to give us an inside perspective from a Jewish point of view, as now a Jewish Christian, uh, of what is really going on in the Middle East? What do we need to know? What's real? What's myth? What's fact? And uh, why is that such an important area uh, to be concerned about? So Olivia Milnick, he will be here April 24th, Lord willing, if the rapture has not happened. Uh, with that said, we want to welcome you here. And if tonight is your first night or if you've been here for a couple weeks or however long and you've yet to fill out one of these exciting Connect cards, if you could fill out one of those, should be somewhere near you. That would be fantastic. We would love to connect with you. Put your name and address there if, uh, and phone number or email something so we can connect with you. And there's some check boxes there if you've got questions about Sunrise, the church, or there's prayer requests. And if you could put it in one of the two offering boxes there in the back as we exit, that would be greatly appreciated. But hey, we're not only going to welcome you here. Who else? So we're going to welcome Leanne. That's right, Leanne, right here in the second row. But be beside you. No, your husband. He's on the other side of you. Right. But, uh, but besides Leanne, it's not only her husband there with that nifty looking shirt on. Uh, but besides you guys, we're going to say... Howdy ho to you, part of our online family, and tonight is no different. We're going to the land of Pennsylvania. That's right. How many guys speak Pennsylvania? Really, John, you do? Can you give us your best impression? All righty, whatever you said, we'll just lay hands on you later. But uh, Angel is our first one in Pennsylvania, also has been tuned into our studies, and so is Heidi. So we get to give Heidi a Heidi ho in uh, Pennsylvania. So on the count of one, two, that's right, rhymes with three, three it is. We're going to say a big old howdy ho to part of our online family, Angel and Heidi in Pennsylvania. Thanks for tuning in on the count of three. One, two, three. Nice. That's incredible. That's right. And also we want to encourage our online audience, if you're interested, to become a member of Sunrise Bible Church. Shoot us an email at membership at getalifemedia.net. Why? So you can be a member. That's right. So you can be a member. Right, And uh, if you know somebody outside of Vegas that's interested in that, they can orbit the planet with Pastor Bobby. He'll take you through some good theology that rhymes with the Bible. What a concept. That must be why we called ourselves Sunrise Bible Church. Bible Church. That's right. Praise God. We worked on that timing all week, and we nailed it. Nailed it. That's what shepherds do. We just sit around and practice dumb stuff. But that's right. Let's move on. If you believe that, we'll lay hands on you in a profound way later. Hey, speaking of which, prayer ministry here local or online, if you have a prayer request, the fastest way to get to the prayer team Right there, prayer at getalifemedia.net. Also, again, we're getting ready for round two. Lord willing, if we're still alive and still here, the internship ministry, basically the fancy word of saying Bible college, seminary level training, all the way to doctoral level if you wanted to, uh, right here at sunrise, Monday evenings. So uh, basically become a homemade satellite campus of Tyndale and uh, out of Fort Worth, Texas. And so if you're interested in that, locally, see Pastor Bobby here at the front after service or shoot us an email, internship at getalife media.net. But we're going to take an offering tonight. And if you're interested in that, and if you feel so led tonight here locally, you can just drop it in one of the two offering boxes there in the back. And that would be greatly appreciated as we exit. Or if you're watching online, you're part of our online family. If you feel led to give, you can do that in three different ways. One, you can go to the appropriate website and you click donate or give there. Or on the website, you'll see the mailing address if you want to mail it in. Or even now, you should be able to see a number appearing on the screen that's your texting option your texting option. So let's go ahead and pray for that, and then we'll pray for our study. Father, we love you, and thank you so much again for <clears throat> another opportunity that we, your people, the church, your body, can come together and do what you called us to do, uh, and frankly, what the word church means. It's a group of called out ones from this wicked world system, and we gather together, plural, as your people, to get equipped, and that we would go and do the work of ministry, and that we would minister in your name out in this wicked world system until you come get us one day. And so may that be the case tonight. May we grow in you and learn and, 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 and just be built up strong, certainly in these last days. We thank you that when we gather together, we also have a privilege to, to give back to you and certainly give of our treasure. And we pray if we give tonight in this offering, we pray that you uh, would cause it to be biblical. You tell us not to give under compulsion, 
which means feeling like we have to or feel guilted into it. Of course not. You, you say we should be cheerful givers, just like we hopefully and prayerfully cheerfully give of our time and service to you and our talents. So it is with our treasure. We just want to work together, God, and, and, and pull together resources that you've given to us so that we have everything we need to be those last day's disciples. So we pray that you bless this offering tonight, that you be glorified in it, will your church be edified, and that lost souls, people in need of being saved here in Las Vegas and around the world, would truly be saved as a direct result. So please bless this offering. And God, now as we turn to your word, we just pray that you would open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, give us those ears, not only to hear what you would share, but most importantly, to obey. Uh, it's specifically when it comes to messing around, flirting with, getting outside your scripture, the word, the Bible. Uh, it's the beginning of the end, and it happens every single time. Whether we think uh, we can figure life out without you with our brain or our feelings or experience or even tapping into the so-called spiritual realm, all three of those always lead to a shipwreck. So please help us to stay true to your word, obey what you have to say, all of your commands, not just your yeses, but even your noes are for our good because you love us and you don't want us to be lied to and deceived and destroyed. So please, God, help us uh, with that. And again, as we get equipped on this issue, we just pray that, God, if we know people who are involved in some of the very things that we'll be you willing talking about tonight, that we would get equipped to be able to share them with you so they could be led to you. And if you're not saved, that they'd be saved. Oh, God, please bless our study tonight. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Hey, once again, we are in our study, World Religions, Cults, and Alcohol, number 16 in perfect Pennsylvanianese. John Hood says what? Hey, give, a, give, a, give them a golf clap, which is kind of a half clap, because you did get it right, but I didn't hear no weird Pennsylvanian talk. All right, that's the code word for next week. No pressure. We're going to put you on the spot. Lord willing, next week, John's going to speak perfect Pennsylvanian, whatever. I do, we are already off track, and we got a lot of the ground to cover. That's right. We're in 16 voodoo vampires and the rise of what? Demon worship. Hey, those things aren't real. Yes, they are. And that's where we started in our study. Unfortunately, what? I'll say it again. 65% of the church does not believe in a literal devil, and you think they're going to believe in demons? Are you kidding me? Unfortunately, it's crazy. So we dealt with our first time the existence of demons. Saw very clearly Old and New Testament. The scripture is very clear. There really is a demonic realm out there that you do not want to mess with. It's not just Satan's are real. These critters are real. And uh, that's why we went to, okay, what's their character? Well, they emulate the one that they follow, if you will, Satan. Satan's got an evil character. These guys got an evil character. And it isn't just that Satan's out there messing things up with his evil character. So are these guys. One third of these angels uh, fallen angels in that state uh, have followed Satan. So they're out there. You wonder why things are messed up. It's not just all natural. Sometimes it's spiritual. Sometimes it really is a demonic influence. Then we took a look at the tactics. Okay, where well, they're out there, they're just like Satan. They're evil rotten to the core. Okay, they're really real. But how do they come at us? And not just the world. We took a look at last time. How do they come at us at the church? Because that's what we saw. The sad news is it isn't just as we saw in our 20-week study on witchcraft, our 16-week study on Satanism, that witches are now so comfortable because the church is keeping their mouth shut on it. Same thing with Satanists. That witches have now infiltrated into the church. Satanists, we saw, have now infiltrated the church. To where now most churches are preaching Satanism. Do what thou wilt. It's all about self, 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 me, me, me. Okay, that's Satanism. But as we saw, unfortunately, demons have also infiltrated the church. And last time, if you were here, we saw they've done that with convincing us that we need a new service, right? What was the key word there? Remember that? What was the code word? We need to be relevant. And what does that really mean? You need to be worldly, right? Instead of godly, right? But man, everybody's bought off into that. Well, that was the first mi uh, fatal mistake. The second one says, hey, you need a new Jesus. Remember that? And this new Jesus, which is not the biblical Jesus, right? And by the way, if you fashion Jesus or God in your making, that's called an idol. It's not just unbiblical, it's an idol. And that in itself is a sin, hello. Okay, but the new Jesus is what? <clears throat> never talks about sin, never mentions sin. Doesn't matter about sin, whatever, excuse me? Uh, that's not the biblical Jesus. Why do you think he died on the cross? Just because we had a low self-esteem, a poor economic existence? No, it's because of sin. And what? The penalty of sin is what? We deserve to go to hell. 
But not this new Jesus. Man, he's just happy, chappy, just everything's great. Doesn't matter. And then that led to the new service. Remember that? Right? So now you got basically, you got this uh, new Jesus that never talks about sin. You got this uh, uh, new service that's all worldly. Well, guess what? People who aren't saved, they like that. They like being religious. Right? And so now you got the church flooded with all these people who aren't even born again. And so now enter this new worship. And so it's getting people tricked to, to get into an altered state of consciousness. So now these non-Christians attending church services, if you engage in these practices that are straight out from the occult, then guess what? You're going to get possessed. Isn't that nuts? It isn't just that witchcraft and witches and Satanists and Satanism has infiltrated the church, even demons, to apparently they're pretty comfortable. And dare I say, they're controlling. They're steering and guiding the church. Back to why I think we're in such a a messed up shape in the apostasy as we're experiencing it live. Okay, Now, that's where we left off, <clears throat> kind of dealing with the basis. Is this really real? Is this just preachers trying to scare you and rip you off your money and this all that? No, it's not. This is really real. Okay, Then we said, well, how in the world did we get in this mess, what we basically just described? Okay, uh, And that's where we're at now. The history of demon worship. How did we get in this mess? Not just where the world is now flooded with demonic activity and witchcraft and Satanism, but how did it get in the church? Well, there's a couple things that we're going to hit tonight as we begin that journey uh, of how that happened. And basically, in a nutshell, we're going to see you chose to get off of this. You get out of this book, i.e. God's Word, which is the only reliable, trustworthy source of information, certainly on spiritual matters. Hello. It's always downhill. And we're going to trace that trail in our history section. How did that happen? How did the church basically says, I'm not going to follow this. And I'm going to start hooking up with demonic teachings, okay? Uh, but before we get into that, let's remind ourselves why God says, don't mess with demons, okay? What a concept. Open your Bibles, right? Let's see what God has to say about this behavior, right? Second Chronicles chapter 11. Awesome. How many of you guys read that today? Yeah. yeah. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 15. Now, to grab the context as you're turning there, page 664 in my Bible, if that speeds it up for you. Anyway, uh, as we uh, stall some time, as you turn there and find, where's that at? I haven't seen that for 19 years. Well, it's in there, Second Chronicles. If you find First Chronicles, what do you do? I'm helping you out. Take it right. All right, there we go. So Second Chronicles chapter 11. Uh, as we turn there, this is the account, okay, in the context here of you had King David, and then it transferred to Solomon, one of David's sons, right? Had a heyday there of Israel, but after Solomon, then comes his two sons, okay, and this is where the kingdom splits. You got 10 tribes that go north with Jeroboam. And then you got the two tribes that stay at the same location. It all started in the south with Benjamin and Judah with Rehoboam. Okay, but this is the account when they split. Now, what I want you to hone in on is if you understand the history continuing forward, uh, certainly the 10 tribes that go north. And if you read the accounts, first and second Kings, right, man, did they ever even have a good king? I mean, it was bad. Right? I mean, it's just, it, but you're going to see why it was bad from the very get go, is my point in bringing up this passage. And then you're also going to see that they were the ones who went into captivity first. God sent Old Testament prophets to the Israel in the north, the 10 tribes, okay, again and again and again, but they wouldn't listen. And so he sent the what? The Assyrian army. Remember on Sunday, if you were here, we talked about the fish hooks? That was the Assyrians. And so God just said, that's it. I've given you open window to respond and get back to my word. And they wouldn't do it, so he took them out. Now, unfortunately, later in history, the southern tribe, they had some good kings, but then back, and so they even began to waffle. And then eventually they went into captivity with the Babylonians. But this is the account when the kingdom split. And I want you to see why it was the beginning of the end, why the north was ever destined uh, to thrive. Okay, but let's take a look at that. Second Chronicles chapter 11 says this. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered the house of Judah and Benjamin, the, the two tribes there in the south, 180,000 fighting men to make war against Israel and to regain the kingdom from Rehoboam. So he's going to go get those other 10 tribes and say, hey, nope, you're coming back here. But this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the Israelites in Judah and Benjamin, this is what the Lord says. Do not go up and fight against your brothers. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they what? Notice the difference. They obeyed what? The word of the Lord. Okay, and turn back from marching against Jeroboam. 
Well, then Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem. He built up the towns uh, for defense in Judah, Bethlehem, Atam, Tekoa, Beth Zur, uh, Sako, Adullam, Gath, uh, Mereshav, Ziph, uh, Adorium, Lachish, Azekah, Zorah, Ajalon, and Hebron. And these were fortified cities in Judah and Benjamin. And he strengthened their defenses. He put commanders in them, supplies with food and olive oil and wine. He put shields and spears in all the cities and made them very strong. So Judah and Benjamin were his. So basically, he wanted to go up and attack them. God says, nope, don't do it. Okay, and so he stayed and he fortified the area. But then listen, the priests and the Levites from all their districts, all right, now who were the Levites? That was the priesthood, the ministry, right? Only the Levites, the Levites could be a part of the priesthood, right? It's part of God's command, that's what he says. So the priests and the Levites from all their districts throughout Israel sided with him, Rehoboam. The Levites even abandoned their pasture lands and property and came to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons, okay, had to re what? rejected them as priests of the Lord. Well, wait a second, right? Now, remember, Jeroboam's the one that went north with the 10 tribes. You rejected God's command that only the Levites could be a part of the priesthood. No other tribe. It has to be a Levite. So that was their first uh, sign that they are not going to follow God's word anymore. And then he goes on to say this, okay? And on top of that, he not just rejected him. He what? He appointed what? His own priests. Wait a second. So now you're out of bounds with the scripture. God says only Levites. He says, no, I'm going to do it what? My way. And then for the what? The temple? No. What's the word there? High places. So he sets up his own what? Form of worship that he thinks is right. Right? So now you're not even doing it God's way. And here's, here's what's crazy. And for the what? The goat. And for the goat and the calf idols he had made? What? Okay, you may be seated if you can, but, but here's what we see. And I want to bring this out here. And again, we're talking about the issue of, listen, demon worship. Okay, but you see the 10 northern tribes under Jeroboam, uh, basically what they do. They said, okay, guess what? Here's what God says. He says, you're supposed to do it this way. And they said, what? We ain't going to do it. And then it wasn't just they got into idolatry and their own form of worship. Again, the key word that's there, and this is wild, is the word What? Goat. It wasn't just calf or it was goat. Now, what's wild in the Hebrew, that uh, word there uh, in the Hebrew, okay, is satire, pronounced uh, sa'ir, okay, and you know what it means? It's not just a goat. It's a demon-possessed goat, right? And like, well, why, why would the, the, they talk about a demon-possessed goat? Well, they were into this false worship, okay? The word sa'ir, or what we call today satire, right? Okay, goes way back into Greek mythology. And let's, let's explore that for a second. A satire is a male nature spirit. Okay, so it's basically a demon with ears and a tail resembling those originally of a horse and a exaggerated male body part. And it's about as clean as I could do it. And I'm not going to show you pictures that are all over the place. It's actually very gross and ungodly. But, that, but that's what this was. Right? That's, the, that's the word that's used here. That was a part of their worship, the goat, sa'ir, satire, and the calf worship. This is what they were involved in. They didn't just reject God. They went into this. It's nuts. Now, satires were characterized by their vulgar and lewd behavior, were known as lovers of wine, music, and dancing. Okay. Uh, and uh, they were also uh, said to inhabit remote locales, woodlands, mountains, you know, high places, Pastures, they often attempted to seduce and rape uh, women. Uh, they were also sometimes shown in ungodly sex acts and engaging in bestiality. That's the word that's used here. You didn't just reject God and his order of worship and how he says it's supposed to be done. But you got into this. This is nuts. Now, that's the Greek mythology in classical Athens. Uh, again, that's where we get. Have you ever heard of a satire play? That's this word, and it, it's featuring this type of a play known as a satire play, which is known for its lewd, filthy, and obscene humor. It comes from these goat demons, right? This satire, okay? Now, uh, they combined this. It, it started out as a horse-like creature, okay? Half man, half horse kind of a deal with Greek mythology. Uh, then, in classical Athens, they began to combine it with this critter, Pan, which we saw before in our witchcraft studies, where we get the word panic, you panic, right? 
and that was and often is used as depictions of Satan. Okay, but they began to combine that, and then that's when the legs went from horse legs to goat legs and things of that nature. Then the Romans took this satire, okay, and then they turned it into something called a fawn. And the fawn was a half human, half goat creature, okay, and uh, depicted with uh, pointy ears. The ancient Roman belief had a god named Faunus, you know, like and a goddess named Fauna, right? And they were, quote, goat people. So this is the word that's used here. How many times have we read through that and we're just like, oh, well, goat and calf worship. And how many times they say, wow, they, God says that you need to worship where he says to worship. You need to worship with the, only the Levites and follow how he says to worship with who he says to worship. Okay, but they said, nope. And then they go and establish their own worship. And then they not just worship the idol, they get involved in that. So how many guys would say it was going to turn out well for them? Again, and this is at the inception when they what? When they split. I bring that up to say, guess what? From that point forward, when you read about the 10 northern tribes, Israel, right? And you got Judah and Benjamin in the south. It, it does not go well with them. Some of the most wicked kings in the history of Israel were from the north. And no wonder from the get-go what they do. The fatal mistake. You got off of this. And I said all that to get to this. Believe it or not, folks, I'm seeing the same thing happen, not just in the world, but in the church. We have made a deliberate choice that we're going to worship the way we want to worship, how we want to so-called worship, and we're going to get off. And now it's combining into spiritism, literal demonic activity. It's the exact same thing. It'll never go well. Anytime you get off God's word, slowly but surely, it may take a while, but you're going to end up in a major mega spiritual ditch. Uh, and again, I think that's what's going on uh, to the point where, believe it or not, I believe the church right now is tricked into cohabitating, cooperating and worshiping demons. All right. You're like, well, how in the world did we literally make a decision in the church section of the church? Dare I say not us. OK, to say, you know what? I know that's what God says, but I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to do it my way. Right. Well, let's take a look at that. Believe it or not, it was a slow process over a few centuries to trick people into getting off of God's word, just like Israel. Okay, Now, believe it or not, it starts back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, during that time frame, we saw in our Satanism study, the Romantics. Now, again, not to confuse you with those that cool, hip 80s group. I do. The secret's in your sleep. Yeah, that's why I'm not on the worship team. Now you know why. Right. Rob is very scared of my skills, but uh, let's move on. <laughs> no, that's not what he's talking about, the romantics. The romantics, as we saw back in our Satanism study, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but during this time frame, they were an intellectual movement, right? They knew better than this book, and they were into arts and literary works and music, and they used that as a vehicle because they didn't have internet. That's right. They didn't have internet. That's how you got your ideas out there. Art and literary works and music to, quote, promote, listen, liberalism and radicalism. Sound familiar? That's what's going on today uh, in our country. To what? To get us off of our Judeo-Christian ethic that our country was built upon, including our Bill of Rights and Constitution. Hello. It's the same tactic, okay? And the romantics, it wasn't just they had the better idea to get you away from God and God doesn't, you know, because following God and his commands are boring. We all know that, right? Ha, ha, ha. So we got a better way. It wasn't just that. They came up with a bright idea, and this is where Satanism began to make its inroads. As we saw before in our study in Satanism, they said that Satan was actually a good guy. He was a hero. He's somebody we should emulate, right? Because he rebelled against God. And, and this book is just boring. It's there to brainwash you and, 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 and make you a slave and, and be like Satan. Now, as, as crazy as that sounds, that was the romantics. Now, where I want to back it up and I want to go into uh, who influenced these guys to think that way, okay, was another movement called the rationalists, right? Now, let me define that for you. And this is actually earlier than that. This is back even in the 1600s. Moving forward, and the rationalist was basically the movement, and I quote, that quote, listen, reason is the chief source and test of knowledge. So can I translate that for you? How do you discover truth? Not the Bible. No, it is by man's brain. That's really what it is. I discover truth not by the Bible, turn away from the Bible. It's my brain. That's the rationalist movement. Okay. Now, at the same time, another one, competing one, was going on. This was called the empiricists. 
The empiricist basically says that knowledge comes from, guess what? Not the Bible, not so much the brain, but experience. Does, does any of these things sound familiar? This is how our world operates. Not from the Bible. I will figure it out with my head, and if it doesn't make sense to me, I reject it. And I have to feel it first. It's experience. Okay, It's the same thing, but that's what that is going on. This is the movement, these two, that basically begin to say, don't follow the Bible. You figure out truth either from your brain or from your experience. Let's take a look at the difference. So starting with rationalism, this is the idea that reason is the main source of all knowledge. True knowledge is not just discovered by empirical evidence or sensory experience, but in fact it can be discovered by the abilities of our rational minds. The intellect alone is able to understand and discover true knowledge. On the opposite side we have empiricism. Quite simply, this is the theory that all knowledge must derive from sensory experience. The only way we can ever gain knowledge is through experience. All knowledge is a posteriori and solely relied upon the senses. Right. Now notice that neither one of them said what? Where do I discover truth from? Not the Bible. The Bible's not even part of this equation. It used to be that way in Western civilization, but not anymore. It used to be that way in our country. Not anymore. And once you say, nope, truth is now relegated to my brain or my experience, it's your beginning of the end as your downfall. It's with Israel, back to uh, Jeroboam. What did he say? No. I will do it my way, according to my brain. I will do it how I want to experience this worship. It's the same kind of mentality. It's off the scripture. Now, again, uh, the problem with that is, it, uh, you know, figuring out your brain, if you could figure out everything of all truth, of all time, okay, uh, and certainly God, who defines truth, then think about that. God would be no bigger than what? Your brain, right? I don't know about you, but I, I kinda, I'm kind of hoping God's bigger than our brain. Well, he is, right? He's the one that gave us our brain, okay? Uh, but that would make God no bigger than our brain, right? I expect there's some things that are just out of, you know, that I, I just, I, I, you know, it's beyond my brain because God is beyond my brain. So that's not a surprise. The other thing, too, that's going on there, uh, you know, uh, sometimes God's word is true whether or not it gives you goosebumps or it, quote, feels right, whether you like it or not, whether it agrees with your experience. It's supernatural, right? So, again, either one of those is completely out of bounds, okay? But, again, once you start getting off of that, uh, you're getting into uh, a uh, dangerous territory. Now, from that, you have the, the rationalist man discovers truth by your brain. The empiricist, that man discovers truth uh, with your experience, not the Bible. Then came this lie, and again, we're all dealing with the same time frame, all kind of flooded together, with the lie of evolution. Now, evolution came along. People were already veering off the Bible, thinking that truth was by my brain or my experience. Then here comes the lie of evolution, right? And then it further got people to what? To doubt the Bible as trustworthy and true, if you can't even trust Genesis chapter 1, the creation account, why should I trust the rest of it? And it further pushed people into the other two arenas that I figure truth now, not by the Bible. That's just an old antiquated book full of mythologies I got to do with my brain or experience. Now, as you can see there on the limb there, it says, but what about me? Right? A lot of people believe that this evolutionary mindset began with Charles Darwin. No, it didn't. He was influenced by uh, several different people, including, believe it or not, his granddad. Uh, this is Erasmus Darwin who ate way too many pork chops. He was an English physician, natural philosopher, uh, and one of the key thinkers, right? How did he come up with his baloney? Because he first started out being a part of this age of enlightenment, the rationalist, the empiricist, get away from the Bible. And, uh, and, and included, his ideas believed that everything revolved around human happiness, it's all about me, and that the pursuit of knowledge is obtained, listen, by reason and the senses, right? So again, Darwin's granddad, who influenced him, said, this book, no good anymore. I will discover what is pleasing to me by my brain and my experience. Again, does this sound familiar? This is how most people operate, including in the church, unfortunately. Right? So you're seeing him beginning to combine the two. He's not just a rationalist. He's not just an empiricist. He's both. Right? So that's the first guy. 
that influenced Charles Darwin. The second one is this guy, Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell is the guy that is responsible for the idea that you can't trust the first page of the Bible. When the Bible says, and the first day, and the first day, and the first day, there's a literal six-day creation. This guy is the guy who says, nope, can't trust the Bible, right? And he's the guy that's responsible for the millions and billions of years. And it's really what's going on between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. There's this giant gap and you've got to squeeze evolution. That... No, evolution's a lie. And I don't need to defend that. But that's this guy. And he had a huge influence on Charles Darwin. He wrote what's called the Principles of Geology, espousing this. The earth can't be young. The universe can't be what the Bible says, about 6,000 years old, roughly. You can, that can't, that's crazy. That doesn't work with my brain. I don't care what your brain says. That's not what God says. He's the one that made this place. I think he knows how old it is. right? Uh, and so that's where it came from. But Charles Darwin wrote about this guy who influenced him in his origin of species. Okay, And then came this guy who further uh, propagated this idea that the, the earth just cannot be young, James Hutton. And then he says, the reason why we see the earth in its shape it's in, it's, it's over long periods of ages and time. For instance, when you see the layers in the dirt, uh, it's slow process. Over millions of years, this layer was formed. And then another million years, this layer was formed. And over millions of years, that's why we have the stratification and the dirt. And ex excuse me? That's what's called uniformitarianism over long periods of time. Well, what they forget is, guess what? There's another theory called the biblical theory, which is true, by the way, called catastrophism. That we don't need to explain the shape the earth is in over millions of years, over slow processes of uniform layering, blah, blah, blah. That, the, that it's called one catastrophe could rearrange the real estate really quick. And guess what? It rhymes with the flood. And the flood is why we have the layering that we have. Right? The flood covered the whole earth for over a year. Read the scripture. It didn't just rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah was in that boat with his family and animals for over a year. So imagine the whole earth being flooded. What would happen to the dirt? Eventually it would settle. Have you ever taken a jar of dirt and you put it in, 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 in with water and then you shake it up? What's the dirt naturally do? It settles what? In layers by density. That's why we had the layers. It didn't take millions and millions of years. Oh, by the way, evolution says there are millions of years, neat, nifty layers. Flat layer. They're not flat. Drive around Vegas. Have you ever seen them? <laughs> and, and the rock. Last time I checked, when you try to bend rock, it snaps. So how did you get that? Well, it wasn't rock in the beginning. It hardened into rock, but it was soft mud. And then as the Bible says, after the flood, when God drained the earth and the valley sank down and the mountains rose, that explains it. Case closed, right? So it was this guy who also further James Hutton influenced Charles Darwin, okay? And then comes finally uh, this guy, Charles Darwin, who uh, worked on these ideas because, you know, because you can't trust the Bible, you know, this intellectual movement, right? And he's had all this negative influence, right? And he puts it together in his Origin of Species, and it didn't take very long before he turned himself into a monkey, of the devil, because what is happening here, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, the, the perfect storm, if you will, to get people, and tell me Satan wasn't behind this, hello, okay, he's a liar and a father of all lies, this is a pack of lies that you define truth by your brain or your experience, or God isn't real, and you can't trust the Bible or the Genesis account, that's all from Satan, right, so Charles Darwin, he comes along, and he basically, people are already, uh, again, getting off the scripture, saying truth comes by my brain, truth comes by my experience. They were combining the two, and then here comes Darwin, said, and if you will, puts the nail in the coffin as to why you'd be stupid to trust the Bible. Do you see how dangerous this is? Right? And so that's, that's what was going on there uh, at that time. Now, I said all that to get to this. So that's not a good time. That's like the perfect three-bang punch, not good. Man's off the scripture. It's not going to go well. It can't go well. Did it go well with the northern tribes of Israel when they went off scripture? Guess what? God's consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. All his words for when you deviate, it's not going to go well. So man's off base. Now, here's the point. God tells us in the scripture, though, that uh, you could sit there and say he's not real. But he gives evidence that he's real. And deep down inside, people really know he's real. You ever heard the old phrase, there's no atheists in foxholes? Yeah, you get on the deathbed, you get in the hospital, your life's on the line. Uh, you, all that intellectual experience truth uh, goes right out the window, typically, right? People know inherently. And the reason why is because if you read the Bible, which I highly recommend, right, Andy? Yep. 
That's right. Uh, God put that in our hearts, right? Ecclesiastes 3.11, he, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He is what? He set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So this is why you have this innate knowledge. Why is it that every culture on the planet has an innate knowledge of God? Well, it's because he put it in there so that we would hopefully seek him out. And this is why Paul says later in Romans, you ain't got no excuse. Well, I, I, I studied evolution and I didn't think you were real. I used my brain or my experience. I, you ain't got no excuse because the brain I gave you told you something different. Right? And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God made it plain to them. Well, how do you know? His creation. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. How? Being understood from what? From what has been made so that men are without excuse. You're not going to stand before God. God, I just, I believed in evolution. That's what I was taught in school. Or my brain, I just doubted you. And I just, but hey, it's not my fault. You can't send me to hell because I didn't know. The light of creation is the first evidence there. Design. You see, designing something implies what? A designer. Aren't you glad, guys glad that the vehicle you rode over here was a process of millions and billions of years of stick, rocks, and erosion? Don't forget exfoliation. That's right. And the expansion of those rocks. It blew up one day into that perfectly formed vehicle, and you just happened to ride it here today. Yeah, we wish it came that way because it would be a lot cheaper. Okay. Uh, but it, No. It's designed by a design. That's common sense. Our bodies, just our bodies, have about 50 trillion cells, which all have to be there, all perfectly formed and functioning, all with our organs perfectly functioning. Uh, how well do you exist with a half a heart, right? How about one-third of one lung? Yeah, it rhymes with dead. Last time I checked, dead people have no babies. So how do you procreate? It's, it's ridiculous. So that's why God says, you got no excuse. I gave you the evidence of design. Look at anything in that world. The stars, the trees, the bees, the fleas, you and me. Excuse me? You didn't come from the goo to the zoo to me and you. Your brain that I gave you tells you that. You got no excuse. And then there's other arguments God gives, the argument of being, morals, uh, and design we talked about. But here's my point. So inherently, God gives us the ability. I don't care if you say, oh, I've been influenced by these guys that said truth comes from your brain or your experience or the lie of evolution. You know there's a God deep down inside. Well, I said all that to get to this. At the same time this was happening, at this period of history, that man says, nope, I'm going to get off the Bible and discover truth by my brain. Nope, I'm going to get off the Bible. I'm going to discover truth by experience. And then I'm going to combine the two. And then here comes evolution to get you really to doubt God's word. There is still enough innate knowledge of mankind say, no, nah, there's got to be more to life than this. Right? Uh, I, I know that's what they're telling me. I came from an ape instead of Adam. But uh, there's got to be more. Now, I said all that to get to this. That gave rise to this spiritualism. And even though Satan tried his best, okay, to get people completely off the Bible by following truth by the brain and experience and doubting God's word, people still have this innate knowledge from God that there's got to be more to life. Now, the problem is Satan steps in again and still gets people to what? Now they're going into, quote, spiritual things, but they're doing so apart from, still apart from the Bible. Do you think it's going to work out well? No. In fact, in the Bible, God tells you, don't mess with this. Don't mess with this spirit. But this is where people are at. And this is how it began to uh, play out, okay, with this spiritualism. And basically, people now were trying to understand truth, okay? Maybe they felt that, no, nah, it's bigger than your brain. No, nah, it's more than your experience. I'm not sure I believe this ape thing, goo to the zoo to me and you. There's got to be more to life. Unfortunately, they began to try to understand the spirit world apart from the only book that tells you the truth about that place and that plane of existence. Okay, that was the downfall. But that's what they people did. Now, let's define what is this spiritualism. And again, this is that movement. Again, we're talking about 17, 1800s especially, okay? Uh, one guy says this, the hit television shows Ghost Hunters Beyond Crossing Over, just to name a few, provide good examples of this spiritualism. Uh, through stories that they on these shows, the world is confronted of tales of so-called contact with the spirit world, some heartwarming, some horrific. Those who participate in these kinds of practices do not understand or fully appreciate uh, the considerable spiritual risks they are taking. In other words, if you read the Bible, God says, don't mess with this stuff because this is opening the demonic realm. This is not a game. You don't flirt with any of this stuff, right? But it became spiritualism, a pseudo religious system. Okay, again, kind of a rejection of this and this 
They, there's got to be more to life, so they get into this. It's a pseudo-religious system that believes, listen, a soul survives after death of the physical body, and these, quote, disembodied spirits are, listen, willing and able to communicate with living persons. Is that true? No, that's everywhere, including Hollywood and these shows. Well, that's that ghost is Aunt Vera. It's Abraham Lincoln. Cleopatra is speaking from the world beyond. And no, it's not. What's the Bible say? When you die, if you're a Christian, you go straight to heaven and you don't come back. Anybody glad you ain't coming back? Yeah. Okay. Or if you die apart from Christ, you go straight into hell. There is no crossing over. There's no coming back. The Bible, as we dealt with in great detail in our witchcraft study, calls that a familiar spirit. That's the code word for what? It's a demon impersonating that loved one. The Bible's very clear. You're in heaven, so shall it always be. You're in hell, unfortunately, so shall it always be. So that's, but that's what these people believe, that these spirits are dead people, right? And we can contact them and things of that nature. That's what's behind it. And they do believe in a, quote, a God, but they refer to it as the infinite intelligence. Or you may have heard higher power and things of that nature, right? Uh, they also do not believe that death marks the final point of judgment for a spirit. Well, some of the Bible says, Hebrews 9.27 says what? It is appointed man to die what? Once and then face judgment. But here's, here's the point. The souls say, uh, but they say souls have the capacity. Listen, this is after death. They have the capacity, the souls to, quote, learn, grow. Here's the key word. Evolve. So now they take evolution, the influence of that. They've rejected God's word. They're trying to understand the spirit world, but they combine it with evolution that these spirits can evolve after death. So it's kind of like a, a, a quasi version of reincarnation, uh, which is not true. Okay. So they say that they can evolve after death to progressively higher planes of knowledge and perfection. And then, as you've seen in the movies, once they achieve, you know, they can prove that they could be a good person, then they get to heaven. Or once they settle that problem that they had with that loved one, then they can be free and they can go into bliss. That's spiritualism. It's all demonic. It's all a lie. And it's out there deceiving people. Right? Spiritualists do not believe that Jesus' death paid the penalty for sin, that salvation comes by grace through faith alone in him, but rather, they say, souls gradually progress after death uh, towards spiritual perfection. Therefore, it's a works-based route of salvation after death, which is very dangerous because they think, well, if I die now, at least maybe I can get a second chance at it. Next time around, there is no second time around. This is it, man. Read the scripture, but that's the problem. People aren't, right? Again, it began to take off, and we're going to get into more of these people in greater details down the road, but I want to give you some highlights of how that movement started, what influenced it, and then how it began to permeate on up to today. And unfortunately, as we're going to see in a couple of studies, Lord willing, the church. It's crazy. Okay. Uh, but anyway, basically, this was a movement. They're seeking truth now outside the Bible. Okay, forget the brain thing. Forget the experience. I'm going straight to the spirit world. That's how this is what this movement really in a nutshell is. Okay. And, and again, uh, part of what really got people into this, not only was uh, kind of rejecting the, uh, this brain experience, doubting the scripture, but they knew there was more to life. It wasn't that. It was also during this time in the 1800s and the early 1900s, you had the Civil War, you had World War I, and there were millions of people, uh, loved ones that had died. And so here comes this way, you can contact them. So that was another thing that seduced people to go along uh, into this. And again, by that time, evolutions made even bigger head roads, got people to doubt God's word, figure out everything with your brain experience. Everybody's completely off whack, okay, as well. But anyway, so that's basically what it was. Uh, we'll probably have a whole study just on these guys. In the United States, in about the mid-1800s came these ladies Margaret and Kate Fox, they really pushed spiritualism here in the United States big time. Uh, and this was in Hydesville, New York. They made the first astonishing, quote, announcement that they had contacted a spirit of a murdered peddler in their home. And the peddler communicated with them by knocking on a table or wall. And, oh, really? So now we can talk to dead people and maybe my loved one that died in the Civil War and World War I, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so people began to do what? They began to have seances, right? And it especially flourished among the upper class and wealthy America. Then you got these guys, and again, we're probably going to get all this more in detail later. Uh, then you, these guys begin to tour the country 
uh, mediums like uh, this guy, Paschal, Beverly Randolph, and Cora Scott. They toured the country giving lectures and demonstrations. See, it's real, right? And then at the same time, this guy appears on the scene, Franz Mesmer. Look how happy he is. <laughs> you don't want to mess with this world. The spirit world is crazy, folks. It's not a game. Franz Mesmer, where we get the word what? Mesmerize? Mesmerism? That's where it comes from, this guy. And he was into this with the spirit world, and that's how we can manipulate and provide healing and things of that nature, which, uh, as we'll see, was an a, a influence on the charismatic community uh, with their so-called healing uh, aspects as well. Uh, then uh, eventually, believe it or not, you get people who begin to be, quote, and this is the word that's used here, devote. So this wasn't just somebody dabbling. This has now become their life. People such as Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife was huge into this, okay, which we'll probably expose again later in study. And it's a good thing that this basically seeking the demon world for contact and communication, which again, God forbids in the scripture because it's demonic, okay, it's a good thing it only happened with her politically in office. We're probably going to have a whole study not only on Nancy Reagan, because I'm going, it's not just the Democrats, there's Republicans gotten into it too. But Hillary Clinton. Yes. We're going to hit that baby again. Remember her in the White House? It's still in print. She had seances trying to conjure up so she can get advice from Eleanor Roosevelt and Gandhi. Remember that? It's still in print. And people just laugh about that. So this aspect is never really left politics. And so we'll probably have a whole study just on that. As crazy as that sounds. Then it began to get uh, popular in the literary world. And we'll probably hit, hit this guy again. This guy, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. yeah. A lot of books. A lot of movies been made of that. Sherlock Holmes, Mysteries, all that stuff. Okay. At this time, he was heavy duty into this. Okay. So he's influenced by the occult. And then, praise God, certain people began to raise up and ex uh, expose the phonies. One of them is this guy you may have heard of. He wasn't just a magician. He exposed these phonies, Harry Houdini. We might talk about him more, but Harry Houdini also began to expose the fakery. Now, a lot of them, it was just, you know, somebody's in the back behind the curtain. Hey, did you hear the table knock? You know, so there was a lot of chicanery that still goes on to today, including in some of the churches that, hey, that's the spirit of God. No, it's not. Remember that? Remember that one? They, they say, oh, it's gold dust, gold dust. Remember that? The lady admitted on tape, on tape that her job in that church was to put the, she went to Hobby Lobby and got the fine gold dust and she put it in the air conditioning system. Remember that? Yes. That's the same kind of, well, Harry Houdini, basically, we exposed that for modern day. He did that back in his day, uh, exposed a lot. But it's not always, not always fake. Sometimes they are contacting spirits, but the Bible's clear. What are they? They're demons. Okay, is what's going on here. So Harry Houdini was kind of early form exposing all that. And again, people got into this because they were rejecting, uh, quote, uh, the uh, uh, churches uh, saying that they were just dry, cold intellectualism. And so what they did is they backed into a lot of this stuff. Okay. Uh, again, other people that promoted this was uh, feminism. As we saw in our study, the feminists really liked the spiritual movement because at these seances and meetings, women were a, prime, a prominent figure. And they could have a voice. And they could have a, quote, leadership position in a male-dominated society. As we saw in our witchcraft study, uh, all the early uh, founders of, of feminism were into witchcraft, right? So we exposed that in a whole study, and that's not surprising. So they were into this too. Also, another movement, radical Quakers, that's an early form of some of the charismania that's going on today. Uh, they, they, quote, let's not do it God's way. Let's not, what's the scripture say when we gather as Christians? We're taught the word. Pastor teaches the word. This is why we do what we do to equip the saints. So you go out there, become disciples, and you go out there and do ministering the works of God, right? And then when we gather, we sing songs that are honoring and glorifying to God, right? And we, we uh, uh, take care of each other with the gifts that he's given us, and we're, we're a big family and all that kind of stuff. The Quaker says, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to do it, quote, by an unprogrammed worship as the Spirit leads me. Sound familiar? That's exactly the mindset of a lot of people. It's off the scripture. You go off the scripture, just like Israel, you're headed for a downfall sooner or later. So they really got into this. But, but again, if you slap Christianese on it, it makes it okay. No, but that's the same tactic that's done. And dare I say, it's a lot of stuff that's going on today. You look at most church services that are, quote, considered the most popular. And guess what? 
It's all what? You go there, it's this music, repetitive music, 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 and then you keep doing the music until what? And experience takes place, and it's supposed to be the Spirit of God. I don't think it is at all. Okay, but that's it. There's, there's no real study. All right, let's open up the Bible and let's begin to study the whole counsel of God's Word. None of that. It's the same mindset that's going on uh, today. But that's basically uh, in kind of a, a, a nutshell. But what does God say about spiritualism? Is this something we should mess with, contacting supposed dead loved ones? Not even close. Let's take a look at that. The Bible strongly condemns spiritism, mediums, the occult, and psychics. Horoscopes, tarot cards, astrology, fortune tellers, palm readings, and seances fall into this category as well. These practices are based on the concept that there are gods, spirits, or deceased loved ones that can give us advice and guidance. These gods, or spirits, are demons. The Bible gives us no reason to believe that deceased loved ones can contact us. If they were believers, they are in heaven enjoying the most wonderful place imaginable, in fellowship with a loving God. If they were not believers, they are in hell, suffering the unending torment for rejecting God's love and rebelling against Him. So if our loved ones cannot contact us, how did mediums, spiritists, and psychics get such accurate information? There have been many exposures of psychics as frauds. It has been proven that psychics can gain immense amounts of information on someone through ordinary means. Sometimes by just using a telephone number through caller ID and an internet search, a psychic can get names, addresses, dates of birth, dates of marriage, family members, etc. However, it is undeniable that psychics sometimes know things that should be impossible for them to know. Where do they get this information? The answer is from Satan and his demons. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Acts also describes a fortune teller who was able to predict the future until the apostle Paul rebuked a demon out of her. Satan pretends to be kind and helpful. He tries to appear as something good. Satan and his demons will give a psychic information about a person in order to get that person hooked into spiritism, something that God forbids. It appears innocent at first, but soon people can find themselves addicted to psychics and unwittingly allow Satan to control and destroy their lives. Peter proclaimed, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In some cases, the psychics themselves are deceived, not knowing the true source of the information they receive. Whatever the case, and wherever the source of the information, nothing connected to spiritism, witchcraft, or astrology is a godly means of discovering information. How does God want us to discern His will for our life? God's plan is simple, yet powerful and effective. Study the Bible and pray for wisdom. Hey, what a concept. But apparently that's too simple nowadays. Right? Now i got to figure it out just with my brain or my experience, because uh, we all know it's not true. And, uh, but you know what? There's something inside me that tells me there's got to be more to life. So let me go mess with the occult. But if you read the Bible, God says, don't you dare. It's going to lead you straight to opening up doors with demons. Uh, God never blesses this. Right? He only warns about it. But remember King Saul? He resorted to, well, uh, let me just try the witchcraft thing. Let me, let me try this occult thing. Let me try to drum up a, 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 what happened. Uh, he not only lost the kingship, but he died as a result. God judged him. And Paul, when the so-called fortune teller, right, when they cast what? A spirit of a, no, a demon. It's a demon, right? So this is all demonic. God will never uh, bless that. And unfortunately, that's what's going on uh, today. Now, there began to be another merger, and I want to get to that uh, real quick. And so as we close it out, so basically people got off the Bible, 1600s, 1700s, starting to go to that. Birth Satanism, same time frame. But then the rationalist, the brain figures out truth. The empiricist experience. Evolution puts the nail in the coffin, but people know there's got to be more to life. So then they turn to spiritualism, opening up the occult. Okay, now it began to uh, merge all this into another one, uh, which is a super, super bad combo. And that rhymes with this secular psychology. These guys, listen, the premise, in fact, let me read to you the definition of secular psychology, the study of mental process and behavior. 
And really, the whole movement of secular psychology, and this is the same time frame, folks, that all this is going down. These guys come up with secular psychology, and basically, I'm going to watch how goofy this is when you string it together. I'm going to use man's brain and man's experience to decide the truth about man's brain and man's experience. <laughs> ah, it's called circular reasoning. How do you think that's going to work out for you? Only God tells us the truth in his word about man's brain and man's experience. Why? Because he's the one who made us, and he's God. But that's the movement. Now, it isn't just that second psychology says, I'm going to, def- to help people learn the truth about man's brain and man's experience, mental help, man's brain, and man's experience with man's brain and man's experience. Here's the point. These guys, and this is what typically people don't realize, these guys combine that with the third one, spiritualism. Got it? So these guys, and I'm going to hit two of them, we're going to close. They basically started this movement. We're here to help you. Today, it's all throughout the church. You are not able, if somebody needs counseling, where do they go? Psychologists, not the Bible. And the whole movement started with guys who says, don't follow the Bible. Uh, Freud was a big proponent of evolution, thought the idea of God was a myth made up by our forefathers to cope with life. So he was an atheist, right? But so they basically said, Forget the Bible. If you need help, if you need, quote, counsel, let these men use men's brain and men's experience and the occult to improve your brain and your experience. Do you think it's going to help? No. And people said, oh, come on. They weren't. Okay, I get it. They were trying to use their brain, their experience to figure out man's brain and experience, and that's kind of goofy. Uh, But uh, were they really involved in the occult? Yes, on a massive scale. We've dealt with this before, but I'm going to have to hit it again uh, and finish it out uh, tonight. Freud admitted uh, that if he had to do it all over again, uh, he would uh, go down the occult 100%. Okay? But Freud, in my opinion, uh, at best he was insane. Uh, I'm not joking. Or uh, that and or he was possessed. This guy was one of the biggest drug addicts on the planet. He was a sexual pervert. And I'm supposed to listen to him for family advice? Over the Bible? Don't think so. Let's take a look at that. Sigmund Freud, uh, this guy had major problems. Watch this. Sigmund Freud abused drugs. And when we say that, what we really mean is that Freud really, really, really liked cocaine. Freud loved cocaine so much he discussed it openly with his fiancée and performed experiments centered on cocaine with himself as the subject. While that may be the greatest excuse for drug use ever, he also did write several papers on the wonders of the drug, touting its use in all sorts of things, including anesthesia. However, he did enjoy the high that the drug gave him and definitely used it for more than just medicinal reasons. Freud had a bit of a problem with the ladies, which is a bit of an understatement. A better question would probably be what problem he didn't have with women. Freud believed that women's problems stemmed essentially from the fact that they did not have a male sex organ, and he felt that women didn't have a good sense of justice. He also considered women to be weak socially, to have a jealous nature, and to be exceedingly vain. Freud was also known to believe women to be the problem in society. Freud had a collection of very strange theories, many of which are pretty much discredited today. His main belief was that young children, even infants, had unconscious sexual feelings. Many people may not realize that Freud had a very long-running battle with cancer. This was mostly due to his habit of constantly smoking cigars, which led to mouth cancer later in life. At one point, Freud managed to actually quit for over a year, but eventually went back to the habit again full-time. He has been quoted as saying that cigars were essential to his life and believed that they improved his work. According to some, he smoked as many as 20 cigars in a typical day and had to go through 34 operations, still eventually succumbing to cancer. And I'm going to listen to him for counsel? That guy was messed up. And it wasn't just that. This guy, that's the tip of the iceberg. And and I quote, Freud's letters revealed that he regarded his clients, and I quote, as suckers. He compared himself to a lion in a cartoon that he saw. Quote, the lion is checking his watch and at feeding time and asked, and I quote, where are my Negroes? He called his clients Negroes. Turning down an invitation to travel, Freud wrote that a wealthy woman, one of his clients, quote, might actually get well during my absence. He said, quote, my mood depends very much on my earnings. Money is laughing gas for me. 
And watch this. The talking cure, psychoanalysis, was a scam, quote, for a fee, rich people received absolution for their guilty pleasures and permission to proceed. Freud had an affair with his wife's sister, a lady named Minna Bernays, who got pregnant. His psychiatric theories about incest and sex were attempts to exonerate himself from doing that. Critics says that uh, Freud's uh, psycholo psychological theory was a product of a, his cocaine use. That's where he got inspired from. Right? Which, by the way, remember, drugs open up what? The demonic realm. Right? But it wasn't just he was involved in drugs that open up demons. He was also heavily involved in the occult. And again, he said, if I quote, this is Freud, if I were at the beginning of his career rather than at the end, I might possibly choose just this field, spiritualism, the occult, uh, in, uh, uh, in spite of all difficulties. Now, also, he was not just uh, interested in the occult. He wasn't just a dabbler, quote, he was completely immersed in the subject. He was fascinated with ancient civilizations. His uh, collection of artifacts and relics were extensive. Later in his life, he refused to travel without his occult collection. Such items as statues, vases, reliefs, busts, fragments of papyrus, rings, precious stones, prints, Neolithic tools, Sumerian seals, a great goddess of the Middle Bronze Age, Egyptian mummy bandages inscribed with magical spells, stained with embalming ointment, Hellenistic statues, images of the Sphinx, erotic Roman charms, luxurious Persian carpets, and Chinese jade. This guy was whack. Right? And they also says that components of his, quote, dream interpretation theories was derived from his, quote, occult research. He was heavy into investigating the phenomena of mental telepathy and thought transference, and, quote, he was a practitioner of the tarot card. Hello. Right? Okay. And uh, connecting tarot card and psychology, okay, quote, informed his professional work. Quote, it is wrong to regard Freud as a uh, rationalist who rejected the cult outright, Freud listened to the arguments in favor of the occult, and he believed in the occult, and he assimilated that into his teachings. And I'm not only going to listen to him, a guy who was an atheist, who mocked the scripture, uh, denied God's existence, mocked you and I for believing in God, but he was addicted to cocaine and nicotine, and he was opening himself and traveled with occult items, and it is uh, over this? And again... I, I understand the world doing that because they don't know Christ. They don't know better. But for people in the church saying, I, 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 I need help. I'm having some challenges with my thinking or my experience, my behavior. Well, I'm sorry. We're not able to help you as Christians. You need to go to one of these guys. The church has been brainwashed, folks. This is demonic. Now, real quick, we got to get into the other guy because there's another guy who took it even further. This guy, I have no problem saying he wasn't just whacked. He was demon-possessed, okay? And that's Carl Jung, okay? He took it to a whole different level. He admitted, as we saw before, that where he got his ideas was directly from the spirit world. Of course, he didn't call them demons. The Bible does. Familiar spirits. He called them archetypes. He even named them different names. And he said, this is where I got my ideas from, from demons. Hello. He admitted it. But let's take it even further. This idea of Jung is nothing new, getting involved in the occult. He was involved in the occult from a young age, and here's the point. He never stopped. He never stopped. Okay, And this is from his own writings talking about what he did every Saturday night. It rhymed with going to seances. Watch this. Carl Jung was involved and experienced many paranormal activities which focused around the occult many which were caused by the use of seance. In his book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, an account is made of paranormal experiences occurring during his student years around about the time of 1895. During the summer holidays in his late teenage years, something happened that was destined to influence him profoundly, causing it to play a heavy influence on his future work, which he is well known for today. As I quote from the book, One day I was sitting in my room, studying my textbooks, in the adjoining room, the door to which stood ajar, my mother was knitting. That was our dining room, where the round walnut dining table stood. The table had come from the dowry of my paternal grandmother, and was at this time about 70 years old. My mother was sitting by the window, about a yard away from the table. My sister was at school, and our maid was in the kitchen. Suddenly, there sounded a report like a pistol shot. 
I jumped up and rushed into the room from which the noise of the explosion came from. My mother was sitting and flabbergasted in her armchair, the knitting falling from her hands. She stammered up, saying, what's happened? It was right beside me, and stared at the table. Following her eyes, I saw what had happened. The tabletop had split from the rim to beyond the center, and not along any joint. The split ran right through the solid wood. I was thunderstruck. How could such a thing happen? A table of solid walnut that had dried out for 70 years. How could it split on a summer day in the relatively high degree of humidity characteristic of our climate? If it had stood next to a heated stove on a cold, dry winter day, then it might have been conceivable. What in the world could have caused such an explosion? There certainly are curious accidents, I thought. My mother nodded darkly. Some two weeks later, I come home at six o'clock in the evening and found the household. My mother, my 14-year-old sister, and the maid in a great state of agitation. About an hour earlier, there had been another deafening report. This time, it was not the already damaged table. The noise had come from the direction of the sideboard, a heavy piece of furniture dating from the early 19th century. They had already looked all over it, but had found no trace of a split. I immediately began examining the sideboard and the entire surrounding area, but just as fruitlessly. Then I began on the interior of the sideboard in the cupboard containing the bread basket. I found a loaf of bread and beside it, the bread knife. The greater part of the blade had snapped off in several pieces. The handle lay in one corner of the rectangular basket and in each of the other corners lay a piece of the blade. The knife had been used shortly before at four o'clock tea and afterward put away. Since then, no one had gone to the sideboard. The next day, I took the shattered knife to one of the best cutlers in town. He examined the fractures with a magnifying glass and shook his head. This knife is perfectly sound, he said. But there is no fault in the steel. So what was it? A few weeks later, I heard of certain relatives who have been engaged for some time in table turning and also had a medium, a young girl of 15 and a half. A group had been thinking of me having meet the medium who produced somnambulistic states and spiritualistic phenomena. When I heard this, I immediately thought of the strange manifestations in our house, and I conjectured that they might be somehow connected with this medium. I therefore began attending the regular seances with my relatives held every Saturday evening. And I'm going to listen to him. And he didn't stop. He was all over the place, right? Seeking truth about man's brain, man's experience, mental illness, right, and your aberrant behavior from the occult. He also was into Hinduism, Buddhism, Gnosticism, and Taoism, kind of a one-worldly religion, grabbing a little bit of everything. Uh, but don't, not this book. You know, just anything goes but that book. Uh, so he's getting his all, information all over the place. He was also a uh, uh, pantheist that all is God which is what you're going to get when you study those other false religions. He also recommended all this truth he was putting together from these sources as a cure for alcoholism. And he had an indirect role in establishing this outfit called Alcoholics Anonymous in their 12-step program, uh, which is not Christian, and it's not Christian-based. Uh, it has a psychological uh, backdrop from Young, and involving the human ego and the conscious and the unconscious mind, the 12 Steps by Definition program is a program of, quote, self-improvement. Is that how we get out of sin and drug use? and all? No, if you try that, you're doomed. The freedom comes from who? Jesus Christ. Uh, and they say, well, they talk about God. Well, that's the problem. It's generic. It's not Jesus Christ, right? The only way to heaven, the only way who can deliver you. Uh, and things of that nature, and quote, it's of an unspecified God. So basically, you can include that, uh, fill in the blank as you want. You could be God. The chair can be God. Is that biblical? Is that how we define God? Of course not. And at the same time, they accommodate agnostic, atheist, and non-theist members as well. And so I I'm going to go to that for deliverance of drug use above the scripture? I don't think so. So he was in that. Again, he was uh, young, back to young. He also had not just uh, an interest, a heavy interest in the paranormal, the occult. For decades, you just saw one admittance of it. For decades, he attended seances uh, and witnessed, quote, parapsychic phenomena. His views on homosexuality, uh, he said, homosexuality should not be a concern of legal authorities and should not be considered a crime. He was also heavy duty into the psychedelic movement. 
uh, and things. Timothy Leary, remember him, Mr. LSD? Yeah. Might have a little study on him as well. Because what do you do? It isn't just taking a trip. That was a movement that led to the 60s movement, the flower power and all that stuff. You seek truth what? Through a spiritual experience via drugs. And typically psychotropic drugs that are used still to this day in the occult by shamans and witch doctors like mescaline and peyote. But that's how you seek truth. Again, all getting off of the word of God. And you're going you're gonna to have a spiritual experience, but it ain't from God. Okay. So Young was involved in that Okay, and encouraged that. Okay, to give psychedelic compounds so that people would have a religious experience, quote, and that led to a reevaluation of his work. So that opened up new doors for him by pushing drugs, psychedelic drugs, uh, to supposedly help people, okay, uh, and things of that nature. Then, as we close, he wrote this thing. It's called the Red Book, right? This thing, this guy, and again, you're going to see this guy, again, I don't think he was just whacked. I think he was possessed. I really do. Uh, and, and you look at this, the red book, the quote, paintings of his visions in this red book were compared to the paintings of visions by Peruvian shaman. What's that? The same things they saw when they're involved in what? Taking the psychedelic drugs as a shaman or as a witch doctor, i.e. it's demonic. So he had the same thing. Now, what's interesting is a lot of people saw that book when he was alive. He had it in his office. Very few ever got to touch it, let alone read it. Uh, in fact, after his death in 1961, the, his heirs held that book and, quote, refused access to it because people were in it. You know, wanted to say, well, what else did he write? Let's see. They said, oh, but you ain't touching this one. It was only later in the year 2000 that the estate of Carl Jung finally decided to allow the publication of the Red Book. And I quote one researcher who read this. He said, and I quote, my interpretation it was so crazy, no wonder Young didn't want people to read this, right? And he, he gives us, again, these are the guys we need to listen to for our troubles when we have counseling needs. And not this, these guys. And he shares such wonderful, healing, freeing truths in this red book as, and I quote, this is Young speaking, be ready to be impacted. You're going to leave here so incredibly healed of your mental illness. He had a mental illness. Watch it. He said, quote, this is Young speaking, and this is in the Red Book. I heard a bird girl announce, only in the first hour of the night can I become human, while the male dove is busy with the 12 dead. I'm free! I'm free! I'm complete in life! Thank you, demon-possessed guy. Isn't this nuts? Oh, and that's the tip of the iceberg. Here's another quote. Watch this. This will this will change your life. The moon is dead. Your soul went to the moon, to the preserver of souls. Thus the soul moved towards death. I went into the inner death and saw that outer dying is better than inner death. You feel better now? Isn't that way better than the Bible? Here's one more. To the extent, he said in this book, that the Christianity of this time lacks badness, it lacks divine life. Take note of what the ancients taught us in images Madness is divine. No, you're mad, dude. And you rejected the divine. You're flat out into the occult. You're listening to demons. This guy is whacked. The guy goes on who read this. I'm almost done. He says, even the physical act of reading this book is daunting. It weighs 10 pounds. He said the first, and this is what's crazy. We're going to go full circle here. The first half of the book includes largely unreadable German, Latin, Greek calligraphy. The second portion of the book if you can tear your eyes from the multi-limbed dragons devouring things or, quote, where is it? Here it is. Goat-like humans. Where have I heard that before? Interesting. Staring you in your face. And he said this. It's like reading a giant textbook, only, you know, blank insane. Yeah, that's the crone retranslation of that word. As far as I know, this guy's not even a Christian, but he's like, what? He says, the content is so hard to decipher or interpret that I, I come to the line that Freud wrote in this red book, or Young did, quote, you will consider yourself mad, and in a certain sense, you will in fact be mad. And the guy says, and for the moment, I find that hard to argue. <laughs> and then he says this, he says, 
as I'm skimming through this, I'm wondering, quote, about what psychotropic gas was leaking into a study or an unruly personal chef was mixing in peyote with his evening meal. Isn't that crazy? Here's the point. I'm going to listen to that, his so-called advice over this. It's, I'm telling you, full circle, man. And he ends up being connected with demons, and what's he draw pictures of? Goat people. Israel, the northern tribes, when they veered off, says, nope, it's the same pattern, folks. God's word is consistent. You veer off this book, you do things your own way by your own experience, and then you start getting involved in the cult. It's going to lead to a shipwreck every single time. These people are not helping people. They're further pushing people down a horrible life. Now, I said all that to get to this. Believe it or not, so now you have the movement, the rationalist movement. Truth is not from the Bible. It's my brain. The empiricist, truth is not from my experience or from the Bible. It's from my experience. Then you have evolution that got people to further doubt and shove them away from God. But then they knew enough that there had to be more from the goo to the zoo than me and you. They began to go into the occult, trying to understand the spirit world outside the word of God. Bad triple combo. Then you saw that Freud and Jung began to combine them, man's experience, man's brain, with spiritualism. And then it began to be turned into a religion by this guy. First in Europe, this guy, Alan Kardec. And then over here in America, back to those ladies we saw earlier, the Fox sisters. And Lord willing, we'll get to that next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our study tonight, and we thank you for your word. And even though we're not under that old covenant, there's still a lot of truth we could learn. There's a lot of application there. If your people Israel at that time stopped obeying your commands, your word, and they decide to institute their own form of worship, what they thought best with their brain and their experience to do, and even wanted to add a spiritual element, but involved in the occult, and it led to their downfall in captivity, it'll happen if we do it today. Unfortunately, God, as you know more than we, it's exactly what's happening. People are not only turning away from you and your word, they're getting involved in the exact same trap. All the enemy has done is repackage it. And in the church, it's just been slapped with Christianese, and somehow that makes it a work of your spirit, but it's not your spirit. It's demonic. So help us as your people, God, to know the difference so that we wouldn't be swayed and that we'd never budge off your word. Your word is the truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Everything we need is right there in the Bible. May we never budge from it. May we never try to define truth from our brain or experience, let alone the spirit world, the occult. Oh, God, please. Keep us free. And God, as we know people, we might know people who are under these mindsets, trying to seek truth outside of you. No wonder things are messed up and it's not getting any better. Help us, God, to love them enough to tell them your truth so they can be set free too. So please bless this study to these lives that belong to you. We ask all this.